Dr. Acklog, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Your story is simply fascinating. You fled political violence in Ethiopia as a young teenager. You ended up a Harvard-educated and trained heart surgeon. And now you're a medtech entrepreneur and CEO. Now that journey must give you so many insights into the topics we're discussing today. Could you share some of those? Sure, I'm happy to talk about my my journey, even though I'm sort of a humble guy, but I, I, it does provide, um, uh, I think, some significant insights into many of the topics for today, in that it's been, I've sort of have had a multi-hued, some might say winding road to where I am today, and it's provided me with perspectives on mul from multiple angles as to where we are with healthcare. I, as you mentioned, I, I spent the first half of my career uh, as a heart surgeon, um, practicing in Boston, at, um, um, uh, Brigham Women's Hospital and elsewhere, um, but I always had this um, um, passion or drive for innovation, for figuring out how, ways to address unmet needs and to improve what we do. It, it was a bit of a um, tick of mine, I guess you might, you might say, and uh, that and that evolved into um, coming up with certain inventions and developing a a, um, a a path towards becoming an entrepreneur where I joined up with a couple of partners um, and we created some early startup companies while we were still practicing heart surgery, which I think back it was a bit was a bit crazy but we had some success and we developed a variety of technologies I developed we developed a device to suck out blood clots that actually put heart surgeons out of business which is which is wow. sort of which is sort of uh, Fascinating. Uh, there's a history of that actually um, and um, uh, that the device was called uh, Angiovac, and um, it was really after that uh, that I saw, you know, there's a lot of satisfaction, obviously, and heart surgery is very dramatic and saving lives and so forth, but I also saw the opportunity to use technology to, um, um, to develop technologies separate from the actual practice of medicine and um, transitioned into a full-time into full-time, into entrepreneurship and starting my own companies. Talk to us about how your work and that of your colleagues is really helping mold and shape uh, the future healthcare ecosystem. What are the, some of the standouts? Yeah, I mean, what we've, we've taken a path. We, have a, we founded a company seven years ago called PavMed, and it's a bit of a contrarian path. Instead of focusing on individual areas like heart, like heart or you know, orthopedics or so forth, we decided to take a very agnostic approach to look at any innovation and be in the position to develop medical technologies. And you know, medical technology is something we're a little bit of the ugly, ugly duckling in, in industry. You know, people hear about blockbuster drugs and vaccines and so forth, and I, sometimes I feel um, uh, it's important to help define that. So, you know, we, medical devices, medical technologies are not simply devices, tools that doctors use to intervene and, in, you know, in the heart and elsewhere, but it includes really three major areas medical devices, diagnostics, which we got a lot of attention for, obviously, during the pandemic, and uh, digital health, which is an upcoming area. So our, our small company, PadMed, has actually committed to being involved in both. So we have uh, products and medical and more traditional medical devices, better ways to do carpal tunnel syndrome. We have a diagnostic company that has, um, called Lucid Diagnostics, that has an exciting early detection uh, process for detecting precancer in patients who have heartburn. And we also have a digital health platform for cancer patients. So, um, uh, and, you know, one of the interesting things that, that I've been fortunate is to, is to pro get another perspective in that I was um, asked to join the board of AdvoMed. So now I actually have, you know, I can see from the policy side as well how, um, you know, what, how, what we do as a country and as a community impacts um, access to innovation and medical and medical technologies. Well, let's talk about that. Access is one of the issues here that we're, we're discussing, health equity. And I know it's got to be frustrating because we all know that not everyone has access to all these innovative medical technologies that you and your colleagues are creating. So what is your concern about the impact that that disparity in access has on patients' health and well Yeah, I mean, we talk about disparities in health equity. I know that's a theme of this, of this summit, um, somewhat often in somewhat theoretical terms. Um, I'm actually on the board of the of Human Rights Watch, so the concept of, of access to health as a, as a right, whether you believe that or not, or just from a pragmatic point of view, as a, from a policy point of view, is sort of central to my heart. So I think maybe the best way to explain it from a technology point of view is to just give a concrete example. So uh, one of my colleagues on the AdvoMed board, um, 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 I'll, I'll credit him with this, uh, about 10, 15 years ago, uh, there was new technology that allowed you to treat heart valve disease without having to open 
open the chest and do open heart surgery. These are called transcatheter aortic valves. And now we're 15 years into this. It's a, it was an ab absolutely groundbreaking um, innovation, innovative technology. Uh, and what the story he likes to tell is that at the beginning, and even to this day, we know that access to this very mature technology that's been around for over a decade is um, in inequitable. And the example he gives, he lives in LA. He says, if you were in Cedar Sinai the day these, the day these um, technologies came out, Cedar Sinai could basically make it a lost leader and, and present it as, you know, cutting edge technology uh, that they could offer to their sort of upper upper um, socioeconomic patients. But you go a couple of miles to MLK Hospital in LA, and to this day patients, even 15 years later, do not have the same access to that. Was well, so, there anything that the policymakers, the lawmakers, people in this room can do to help change that? It really comes down to the process being predictable. Now, now that I'm on the other side and, I, and, I, and you know, I'm, I'm bringing technologies to market and so forth, we need, a, we need predictability. And one of the areas is in reimbursement. So there is actual work that, that came out of the Cures, um, the spirit of the Cures Act that is now called TSET, and, uh, that basically tries to provide a predictable reimbursement path, particularly for innovative technology. So it doesn't become something that only wealthy areas can provide sort of as a loss leader until, until the market figures it out. So there are definitely policy um, uh, initiatives that we can work on to, to, to improve that in medical technology. Your work has straddled the worlds of both the clinical medicine and then medical technology innovation. So I think that that puts you in, in a really unique position. As we wrap up here, drawing on, on your many uh, worlds that you've had your feet in, what excites you most about the future of healthcare and the role that medical technology will play in it? We could spend an hour. Do you have an hour? I mean, there's a lot of exciting things that are going on, and, and, uh, and I would be remiss if I sort of didn't emphasize that. I, I think one area that I find extremely exciting and something we're involved in is the intersection between the digital world and technology. Now, we always think of you know, medical devices as being sort of you know, high-tech instruments, but the digitalization of existing tools, but also the application of digital health much more broadly across healthcare is something that's extremely exciting. And just a quick example of that, there's, this, there's an initiative right now in healthcare delivery that's just getting underground. My alma mater, Brooklyn Women's, announced it this week that they're going to try to develop 200 hospital at home beds. So patients don't actually get admitted in the hospital, they're at home getting treated for things that would previously require hospital care, not sort of just sending them home afterwards, but truly getting their care at home. That requires careful monitoring. We have the ability now with implantable and wearable devices to monitor patients at home at the same level of intensity they could in an ICU where you're getting continuous, continuous measurements of various physiologic parameters that can influence that. To me, that's a really exciting, you know, almost paradigm-shifting way to, uh, where, where, where technology can impact um, how we improve healthcare delivery. Any of your projects that you have in the hopper that you can give us, you know, well, a little preview on, a little, we have, we some have, insights? Yeah, I mean, we have, a, we have a subsidiary we launched last year called Veris Health, uh, which is um, using digital health to improve cancer care. So patients who, 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 who um, most patients who require chemotherapy or immunotherapy require an implant of a port for that to be delivered. And we've, we're taking that port and making it, converting a dump port into a smart port that can actually provide continuous monitoring of parameters that allow the physicians at home through the patient's cell phone and through a cloud-based platform to effectively monitor patients while at home and pick up um, complications such as sepsis or other things at a much earlier stage to prevent complications. Um, so that's, a, that's sort of an example of what I was talking about in terms of the impact of digital monitoring and digital technologies in improving care, something we're very actively working on. And then there's your esophageal cancer yeah, that's, de that's, preventing device, yeah, I mean, detecting and preventing. We're super excited about mm -hmm. that. I think Dr. Han mentioned the, the concept of prevention. And um, you know, one of the most f the fastest growing cancers right now is esophageal cancer. It doesn't get a lot of attention. It's the second most lethal cancer. About 80% of people die, and it arises from heartburn, something that we all know about. It's very common. 50 million people have weekly heartburn. They don't know that they're a setup for potentially esophageal cancer. And so there are now biomarkers, again, like he mentioned, that we have we have a biomarker called Isogard, which can detect esophageal precancer. So not mm. detecting cancer, but preventing cancer by detecting the precancer. And once you detect the precancer, you can monitor it, you can treat it before it develops into cancer. And so uh, non-invasive You can save lives. Absolutely, mm -hmm. is an opportunity to save lives. And that's the goal of the Cancer mm -hmm. Moonshot of, the, of this administration. We think we can play an important role in that. 
Dr. Lee Sean Aklog, thank you so much. CEO and co-founder of PadMed and Lucid Diagnostics. Great, thank you, Kevin. Thank you.